Welcome to Presence, a global conversation for a new earth with hosts Doug King and Cody Deese. Thank you, everyone, and welcome again. I'm glad to be here with my compadre. How you doing today, Cody? Well, Doug, uh, I accomplished a feat since the last time we spoke. And what might that be? I ran my first full marathon. Oh, wow. Uh, We need to put the sound effect for the applause on at this time. That's, (laughs) hey, that's pretty impressive, man. 26.2 miles. Yeah, it was. Um, Wow. Wow. Yep. Year and a half ago, couldn't run a quarter of a mile. Wow. Started running first time in my life. Uh Uh-huh. Lost 55 pounds. Started eating clean. Wow. Wow. And my goal was to run the entire thing, and I ran the entire thing in four hours, 35 minutes. And my, I was just mm. hoping to beat five hours, so mm. I was, like, really fired oh. up. So. How, how did that feel mentally? Oh, man. Well, let's just put it this way, Doug. I'm still walking around with my medal on. <laughs> All right. As well you should be. Hey, look, if I ran 26 miles, I'd be wearing that medal every day. So that's that's impressive, man. Yeah, man. That's great. So life is uh, life's good. Beautiful. I'm, uh, I'm feeling good. How about you? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. You know, uh, here we are. Uh, technically, I guess it's the day before Thanksgiving for those of us that are here in the U.S. I know we've got a lot of you folks that are listening in other countries. In our country, we have a day of Thanksgiving where we recall how you from Europe, the colonialists, came over and took the land from the Native Americans, and we call that Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> perhaps perhaps I'm being a little sarcastic there, Cody. But yeah, there's other ways that you can celebrate Thanksgiving. Yes. More um, positively. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this episode comes out um, the day before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, Doug, uh, let's get to business. I say one question. Yes. If you were to die tonight, Yes. <laughs> well, Do it depends. You know? <laughs> it depends who's asking the question. If it's my wife, uh, she just wants to make sure that she, she's the one in the will. Uh, <laughs> if I were to die tonight, well, Doug, here's the thing: <clears throat> yeah. you don't need to worry about your earthly treasures. That's the right. The question is: Have Thank you goodness. been storing up heavenly treasures? <laughs> heavenly treasures. If you were to die tonight, do yes. you know for certain you're going to heaven when you die? Well, you know, the whole reason that we are introducing this subject on salvation is because it's been a 2,000-year-old discussion, and it's been at the heart of what has been the motivation behind Christianity. As a matter of fact, I've read articles preparing for this one after another showing how Christianity, in the eyes of many, this is not everyone, but there are many who are writing on this and saying that actually Christianity primarily is a focus on hell, that that's its, its, its primary story. It's, it's focused on hell. Now, we know that for those that are listening to our podcast and those that are friends of presence, that that's obviously not where we have been. But we also have people that are listening, Cody, that are new to presence and new to these podcasts and they are and have been in their lives different places with this idea of salvation and i thought it might be a good idea to just paint the picture first of all from a personal standpoint now and i know you've brought this up before in the past about some of your experiences but could you just kind of go through again because your experience was a lot more traumatic than mine was with regard to quote salvation or getting saved could you just kind of outline that a little bit more specifically to just us paint the picture of what we're going to be addressing when it comes to salvation i would love to doug but there's actually not enough time on this (laughs) (laughs) i can understand that yeah so i had okay so uh the tradition that I grew up in, um, everything centered around salvation. So uh, Jesus was the Savior, Mm -hmm. and everything as it pertains to who was in and who was out was who was saved, and they used the term who was lost. Yes. And those basically, those were the only two categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
that humanity existed on. Yes. And the majority of the world was lost. So they would take, yes. take like an interpretation of uh, narrow is the way mm-hmm. and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Yes. And they would say, yeah, broad as in most of the world's headed that way. Right. Uh, and so we put lost, uh, most people that were lost were anyone that, uh, coincidentally enough, and th- say this laughingly, but it was true on a lot of levels. Uh, basically, Protestants, a good portion of Protestants were saved, but... Uh, pretty much all Catholics um, yes. were lost. Yeah, we had the same view. Yeah, uh, and basically that because that was uh, they incorporated works, and in our tradition it was like it's justification by faith. Yes. Um, now, what's interesting about that is is in my experience, um, it was a you got saved. They would even use a language like born again. And I had, they, they taught that it was like a one time, like you get saved or you get born again once. And then that's kind of the deal. Now you grew up a little bit different. Uh, did, couldn't you lose your oh, salvation? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We were not once saved, always saved. That's, that's how we would refer in our denomination. We would refer to your denomination as having a theology of once saved, always saved. And for us, it was that you could absolutely fall away. You could become apostate. Uh, you you could um, lose your salvation, so to speak, uh, through your actions. And as a matter of fact, we put so much uh, emphasis on the ability to fall away that somebody jokingly in our denomination started referring to our understanding as once saved, never saved. Nice. <laughs> See, I would have worked better. I would have worked better in your denomination because yeah. in my world, like the Southern Baptist world growing up, yeah, um, it was uh, once saved, always saved. But I just didn't ever feel like I got saved yeah, or had the full experience. Yes. And so for me, it was seven years old. I had my first experience. I was at a vacation Bible school. And I just remember, I don't remember a lot of that moment, but I remember all my friends going forward And I remember a preacher getting up and him talking a little bit about like an underground torture chamber. I just this was my perspective of it at the time. And uh, I remember thinking, well, who wants to spend eternity there? And I was terrified as a seven year old. I remember being terrified. And so I just ran forward and they were I was like, well, I I need to be saved. I like I don't want to go to hell. And I remember them going, oh, well, you just need to recite this prayer after me. And Doug, I could tell you this prayer because I got saved after that probably six or seven more times. Mm, mm. Um, It was a very, honestly, I'm I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this. I have gone through some counseling uh, just to process uh, the spiritual trauma uh, through the process of this because uh, my first experience they said, you need to recite this prayer. So it went like this. They called it the sinner's prayer. Are you familiar with that? Did you guys I, have I'm that? I'm not. No, no okay. we didn't have it. So what, what okay. was Well, that? the sinner's prayer, um, which I never found a chapter and verse for, for all my fundamentalist friends, uh, just actually isn't in the Bible, <laughs> coincidentally enough. Um, but I think what they leveraged it on was Paul had some wordings like, if you confess uh, uh, Jesus Christ as Lord, believe in your heart, God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So they created this whole prayer, uh, which... Uh, it started with an evangelist called R.G. Lee. I think he passed it off to Billy Graham. And most people are familiar with Billy Graham. He did like these big crusades. And he would have people come forward and basically just say, hey, you need to be born again. And here's how you're born again. And so it went like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart, which is always a weird phrase to me, and be my Lord and Savior. And okay. the only reason you said that is because that was the key to unlock the ignition to get to heaven. I'm with you. Like that was it. And, and so then, that's why it was the was, most important thing. And then you were done. In other words, if you had people, I'm curious about this, growing up, let's say that you had someone that was a faithful member of your Baptist church and things happened in their lives and they just quit coming to church and they lost their family and they went down these different roads that everyone knew were some type of immoral, unethical type of thing. Did, did folks at that point say, well, that person really wasn't saved to begin with? Oh, totally. Yeah, they had their uh, way to wiggle out of it. So oh, okay. basically, they would never say you could lose your salvation. They would just say if you walked away, you were never actually saved to begin okay. with. So basically, there's... Your denomination and my denomination both agreed 
most of the world was going to hell. It was just we used two different ways to say why. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, totally. And uh, yeah. And they had this big thing like what really frustrated them is people that would wait their whole life and on their deathbed recite a sinner's prayer so they could like live like hell and do exactly. whatever they wanted, which actually sounded really exciting to me oh, as a kid. Yeah. Like, well, damn, like they right. they get to do whatever they want. Exactly. But then at the very end, right. they get to be like this man on the cross who was yes. like, Father, uh, remember me in your kingdom. And he's like, oh, yeah, you'll be in paradise. Yes. And that was kind of the gist of mm-hmm. the world I grew up in. And so I had that experience at seven um, I had another experience at 16 where like an evangelist guy came in and he, uh, I remember him, he shared a, uh, an incredibly scary, frightening story, even as a 16 year old, uh, about a car accident that happened. And, uh, this kid, uh, basically like it was like a near death experience. So as a 16 year old, and even now looking back, it was so, uh, manipulative, uh, but it worked because as a 16 year old, I remember just being terrified and going, man, I thought I did this at seven, but I started questioning whether or not I meant it. Cause they would use things like, well, you need to know that, you know, that, you know, that, you know, and Doug, I could never, I felt like I could never get there. I was always like 99% sure. Here's a good line. You ready for this? People listening, drum roll, please. I think you're going to like this one. You know, sometimes as you, uh, kind of cleanse yourself and unlearn a lot of the stuff you were taught. Sure. Uh, there's still those things. It's like a, it's like a bad, like, like Katy Perry song that sticks in your oh, yeah. cortex. Yeah. And every now and then I still have that where like one of these statements will hit me and I'm like, Oh, like it just kind of sends chills down my spine. But uh, one of the guys said, I remember a preacher coming in and he said this, he said, here's the, here's the thing, people. Hold on. Let me get my preacher voice. People. All right. This is how you do good. it. He'd be like, good. If you're 99% sure you're saved, you're 100% lost. <laughs> oh. oh, that's good. Sinners in the hands the of an angry God. Yes. Wow. Now, you can imagine a statement like that, Doug. Yeah. As a 16-year-old. Sure. Well, I'm 99%, I would have taken that. I was at best maybe 80% sure I was saved. And so what did I do? I did what they told me to do. Yeah. I humiliated myself. Yeah. I walked down an aisle in front of a group of people Mm -hmm. and I said another prayer. Yes. I got baptized again. Mm -hmm. Doug, this happened probably four times. Mm. Four times. It's not an exaggerated number. Four times. My parents could probably tell you that. Yeah. Uh, And then the last time it happened, I was, I had done walked away from this town. I was in college at a Bible college, studying Mm. to be a pastor. Yeah. And a guy came in and talked about another near death experience. And I remember thinking, oh my God. And he started talking about how, there's so many pastors that aren't saved and they're going to go to hell when they die, but they have it in their head, but not in their hearts. And I was like, well, that's me. Yeah. And so I yeah. humiliated myself in front of all my pastor friends and came mm. down and got saved. And then that created some real conflict because Doug, then it was like, okay, can you be called to preach from God before you're oh, saved? Wow. Because there was a, there was a, there was a right order of sure. doing things and it was you were born again then you were called so then it got into you really weren't called so what are you doing here and yeah it was pretty messy it was utter wow. humiliating it even got to the point where one of the guys in the community i grew up in came to me and he was like look here's the thing you got to stop coming forward right uh he's like you, you, you if anyone's born again it's you yeah. he's like you got it yeah um but and it's not that i never question the divine uh, genuinely, I questioned my own authenticity. Of course. I was just like, I, I mean, I meant like part of it. Yeah. But I didn't mean the other part. Yeah. And then I had terrifying uh, anxiety at night. And mm. my mom and dad experienced a little bit of this because I woke them up maybe one or two times. I know that, that they knew mm. a little bit about this, but mm. I woke up terrified that the floor was caving in and I was going to hell. Oh, wow. And so when I talk about spiritual trauma, mm. it, this is like a real thing. Oh, yeah. That's why we're talking about salvation. That's why we're we're uh, hopefully reframing a lot of things that come from this amazing narrative, but we're bringing them forward from previous levels of consciousness that we can see now we're actually uh, creating a false self or 
even being used to create great damage to the psyche. I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around being seven years old. I've got a, a little grandson, seven years old, and I'm just trying to imagine this in his mind at age seven, knowing just knowing him at seven in this very moment. Uh, that's uh, that's really a traumatic uh, experience you've outlined. I am curious about this, though. When you thought about being saved or you thought about going to heaven, what came to your mind about heaven? Good question. (laughs) This is my point. You're sitting there pausing and looking and trying to reflect on that. Mm -hmm. But when I ask you about Mm -hmm. hell, it came pouring out. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I ask Mm -hmm. you about hell, it came pouring out. You didn't know I was going to ask you this question. I mean, this was something I I wanted to do because I knew you were going to give. I did know you were going to give your your, uh, uh, experience on the hell thing. But I thought, okay, when when Cody finishes this, I'm just going to randomly ask him, Mm -hmm. what comes into your head, Cody, when you think about heaven yep. so yep yep i mean there, there was very little talked about uh because here's the thing i mean obviously now uh, hindsight 2020 but and also experience this we'll get into this a little bit later but uh i learned very quickly that's how the system operates so you take a concept like hell and it's the best leverage you have for because here's the thing there's one controlling denominator in all of this it's fear Yes. And so how do you get people to do things? How yes. do you get people to come to a location called a church? How yeah. do you get people to give over 10% of their income? How do you, uh, for lots and lots and lots of people, it was, oh, well, you hope that they do it just out of good intentions because they love God. Yeah. But what you find is subtly, and that's very subtle, because yes. they would say, well, we would never do that. But But underneath yeah. all of that was this, well, the truth is, if you don't give to God, then God won't bless you. Right. And the truth is, if you don't participate in this, you might make heaven, but there's a pretty good chance you won't make it at all because you never were actually saved. Because only yes. people who are actually saved actually give over 10%, right. show up every Sunday. Yes. And then don't even get me started on, well, God's counting the cost and there's like this whole judgment thing coming and you may make it to heaven but you're going to make it to heaven smelling like smoke <laughs> exactly <laughs> which i'm like yeah. is that cigar smoke because i'll take yeah. it <laughs> i'll take it i'll take it so uh yeah so so all this was the experience now uh one of the things that was fascinating to me was that hell even at a young age i remember thinking something's not right here can you imagine Think of this. How insulting is it that I would come before God and say, God, I really don't want you, but I don't want to go to hell. Exactly. That's like, I think I heard someone say this once and I love this. It's like, that's like getting on one knee to ask someone to marry you. Yeah. And let's just say her name's Katie. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, and that's like me saying, Katie, will you marry me? Not because I love you and I want to spend the rest of my life with you, but will you marry me because I really don't want to marry Jessica? Right. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's so insulting and ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah. but that was my experience. I mean, that was my right. motivation. That was my drive. And and then, Doug, I hate to say this, but as time progressed, I learned to work the system pretty well. Mm. And I began to do to others what was done to me. Mm. And that was actually the turning point. I mean, people ask me all the time, when did you start uh, moving out of this system that you grew up in? Right. And my first couple steps was I realized the trauma and the damage that I experienced with so much doubt and fear at a young age. I was now at 22, 23, 24 years old uh, doing the same thing to a group of teenagers at the time because I was traveling around speaking and there were thousands of people in a venue. And Doug, I, I, I kid you not, I remember uh, walking in – it was event after event, and, and my wife Katie was with me, and I remember walking in, and they would look at me and say, okay, so here's the thing. Now, they would use this language. We're praying 250 kids get saved tonight. Mm. Okay, first of all, where did that number come? And they would say yeah. things like, God gave me the number. Uh, but then they would say, in a lot of ways, uh, like 
Like we need to see this. Right. So it was very subtle, but it was like, yeah. this is how the business works. Yes. We brought you in. Yes. We paid you X amount of money. Yeah. Now we know it's the spirit that does things. But we need some but, measurable results. But we need some measurable results because that's how this convention counted their numbers. Yes. And that was how you measured success. Was an mm-hmm. event successful or was it not successful? Yeah. How many dollars did it bring in? Oh, yeah. How many souls were saved? Mm-hmm. How many people were now not going to hell and going to heaven? Mm-hmm. And- it was very subtle, and they would never own up to this. And right. if it sounds like I'm like a, like a little bit testy about it, it's yeah. because I experienced that the damage that comes with that manipulation. Absolutely, and that was what woke me up, Doug. Mm. That that mm. set the trajectory of leaving one paradigm and way of seeing the world into venturing out to say this can't be what Jesus was all about. This right. can't be what the biblical narrative's all about. Right. You, th- there, it cannot be built on manipulation and lies, and we need 250 people to come forward. And here's what's even more sad. I knew what to do. Yeah. I knew what to do because I was trained really sure. well to do it. I had experienced it. Mm-hmm. So what worked for me? Well, it's the same thing I'm dealing out with these kids. And so guess what I did? I started creating my own scary stories. Yes. And I began to get up in front of a couple thousand people and say 250 people is what they want then 250 people is what I can give them because yes. that's how I'm going to get a reputation and keep my job in this circuit of speaking. And that's how people are going to think, oh man, this guy's the next Billy Graham. He's the evangelist guy because look how many people came forward. Now, they would say it's the spirit, but then they would say, but the hand of God is on him as opposed to if someone didn't come forward, apparently the hand of God's not on you. So uh, so I'd get up and I, and I remember sharing these frightening stories. And then at the very end of it, I would say, uh, hey, if you're in this room and you don't want to go to hell when you die and you want to go to heaven, then it's very simple. You need to recite this prayer after me. And I would say every head bowed, every eyes closed. <laughs> That's good. That phrase still uh, gives yeah. me cringe. And then um, I would lead them in this prayer. And then that's just how it worked. He did this at every event. And then it was, all right, who in here said this prayer? If you didn't mean it, don't raise your hand. Mm. But if you meant it, raise your hand. Mm. And then I'm going to ask you to take it to the next level. Not only do I want you to raise your hand, but I want you to stand to your feet. And then I would use phrases like, hey, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of him before people, God will be ashamed right. of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Doug, you hear me? So I've you've, been rattling this so whole you've episode. used So far, you've used fear. You've mm-hmm. used guilt. Mm-hmm. And now you're using shame. At- Yes. All of those, all of those, really uh, fruits of the spirit. <laughs> um, which, which, but this goes back to, and what we're going to talk about in salvation as we go along, and the roots of what salvation was about was actually to deliver us from all the things that you just described, because when you talk about, like writing to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter two. The first thing the writer points out is, is that when you move into the realm of God love, that that God love casts out fear. And rather than understanding that, there was somehow this ability to use the other uh, type things of judgment, guilt, shaming, and fear. Well, what's fear all about? Well, it's one of our strongest emotions because it's our survival instinct emotion. Fear is what makes sure that I don't go out there somewhere and get eaten by something. I mean, from our very archaic consciousness days of survival, fear is what keeps me safe and from doing things. On the other side, we don't talk about heaven because while I might use a positive motivation for someone, I might say, you're going to get this reward or this reward or this reward. Whatever reward I'm thinking I'm going to go get today, if I find out that my very existence is threatened, all that goes away. What occupies my mind is I got to survive. So when you prey on people through fear, you're hitting the strongest, strongest element of their survival instinct. And that's why it works so well. Mm -hmm. And we did the same thing in, in my denomination. What's interesting is that neither you nor I decided to abandon the story or to go away from the narrative rather we continued to look at it study it think about it meditate on it and grow in it to a different way of interpreting the same material one thing that we want to make clear because this is a criticism of people who hear this kind of talk oh 
these people completely left uh, the Bible. These people have completely given up on God or Jesus or whatever. It's actually just the opposite. What we're saying is, is that the deeper one goes into the narrative, the more likely it is that you will evolve to see this salvation uh, issue or any other type issues that you're studying in the narrative in a, in a more clear way, have a better understanding. Yep. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and a part of that too is, is I, I often tell people, yeah, you're right. I, I did walk away from Jesus, but uh, I walked away from a particular type of Jesus. And I walked away from a particular interpretation of God. And I walked away from a particular paradigm in worldview in stage of consciousness that no longer worked for me. It no longer worked for me. And I also realized pretty quickly that the more and more I got into the narrative, people ask me all the time, like, was you started reading other books and it led you out? First of all, I have no problem with that because I think all texts are sacred. That's a whole other thing because I think everything is sacred. But sure. uh, yeah. second of that, I'm like, actually, no, it, it it was actually the biblical narrative that led me away from this paradigm because I would start reading things about Jesus and it just, it just did not add up at right. all. Exactly. And I thought there's, Oh, I see. Uh, there are different ways to read and interpret this Jesus. And again and again, yeah. what did you find in the narrative? I mean, the four gospels are filled with it is that th- the very people that came against this Jesus were the religious elite of the day. Yes, they were. That knew the the Torah backwards yes. and forwards. Yes. And knew how to leverage it for fear, shame, uh, who's clean, who's unclean, et cetera, et cetera. And they did they couldn't stand this man, Jesus, because he kept breaking through these boundaries. And and what really is infuriating was is when Jesus stands up in front of them and says, Oh, by the way, I did not come to abandon the Torah. I did not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill, I came to actually bring a better framing, a full framing of what its role and function uh, really is. And so here we're saying the same thing that was said 2,000 years ago. We're not coming here in these podcasts to uh, speak out against these things. Rather, we're coming to say, let's transcend the old interpretation of those things. Let's relook at the material, the data, if you will. And that's what we're going to do in this uh, podcast series with salvation. Yep. And I think that's really important. And actually, I think that's one of the things that uh, our culture right now is waiting for. We've talked about this before, but as you evolve through the spiral, when you get to that modernity stage, um, you're deconstructing. And where I think a lot of our world is right now is, okay, it's anyone can tear down this barn. Anyone can tear down this system. But the question is, who and when will we begin to reconstruct some things? And I think reconstructing and reframing is where our culture is right now going, okay, we know we don't believe this. So we know that there's not an angry God somewhere who desires to send people to hell unless you recite a certain phrase or a word, and even that's debatable. Okay, we know we don't want that. But then there is a lot in the biblical narrative about salvation, so what do we do with that? Okay, we know we're not for this God who judges people, but yet there's a lot about sheep and goats and judgment, so what do we do with that? And like good liberals would be like, well, you just skip over them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but... But but we can't do that. It's no. like, yeah, but they're there and maybe there's something to them that you don't have to fear. Maybe it's something really, 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 really beautiful that we can jump into and begin to see. And so when you get to new stages of consciousness, it's really important to go back to the biblical narrative and begin to reread some of the things that you read. And look, I get it. That's difficult sometimes because it's a tradition sets itself on your shoulder and it ingrains these ideas in these particular worldviews in your head. And sometimes you'll even read a text where I'm like, um, but then I realize, oh, that's not the text. That's a part of the world that I just left behind. Yep. And that's how they would interpret that text. That's it, buddy. So the next couple episodes, let's Doug jump into salvation. We should probably talk about judgment at some point down the road. We should we talk will. about heaven. We should talk about hell. We will. We should talk about all of that because that sounds like a good time. Sounds like a great time to me, and that's why we do it. Awesome. Well, for those that are listening, we're just kicking around salvation this time. We'll jump into 
a little more nuance in the next episode. So I hope you guys have a fantastic week. See you next time. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at info at presence.tv. You can also visit our website at presence.tv or find us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you.